The technical term can be called gibbeting, or hanging in chains. This punishment was used on the nearly dead. Yes, you heard me correctly. Of course, there were many ways in which authorities could hang you. But right now we are looking at the medieval gibbet cages. This form of torture has been around a very long time, from the biblical era right up until the 1800s, and let me tell you now it has been used all over the world. Not just medieval England. The hanging of criminals is in the Old Testament. The Romans of course partook in this type of torture, plus you will find stories from as far as Mad Max Australia with men swinging in cages. You would have ended up in one of these after a judge chose to put an extra condition on your execution. This may have meant after you had been tortured, your life was hanging in the balance. It was right at this moment you were transported, then hung up in a contraption of chains. For the world to view you watch you gasp your final breaths. Another option was if you had been evil enough you were hung in them very much alive and simply left there to starve to death. Dehydration would most likely get you first in the summer months. These have been known to be found on the walls of castles in Italy. Other criminals were killed and their bodies were simply put on display or cut up and sent to various corners of the city. Like a billboard in Times Square, these men or women hanging were there to send a message. You would have been hung in a very public place, such as crossroads, waterways and public highways. You could be hung up high, down low, even in the water. All depending on where you were sentenced and what your crime was. This horrific form of death was often used for a variety of lawbreakers. Most who hung were traitors, murderers, highwaymen, or the classic pirate. But don't count out the poor and starving. During tough times the royalty and nobles certainly needed to keep the peasants in line, and this was a great place for a sheep stealer to be made an example of. Of course the desired outcome by authorities was to discourage other members of the public committing similar offences. We are going to delve into some historically gruesome cases of gibbeting. But first what were hanging irons actually like? One version is simply a cage, just like a giant bird cage but it could fit a human. Then you had the other version which was basically a cut out iron body. You would simply fit inside the most uncomfortable upright sleeping bag that was not only designed to humiliate but kill you. It was just big enough to hold the weight of your body, with no room for movement. After the initial injuries that you would have endured from the executioner, you would then have been manhandled and transported to your cage destination. Your body then fitted into the iron corset where unfortunately you would hang upright until you finally passed away. Sometimes if the criminal was hung, drawn and quartered the authorities may choose to send each body part to a different town to be put on display. Talk about maximizing your advertising budget. Other criminals may be covered in tar to stop the corpse from rotting while hanging in the open air. Allowing a warning for everyone to be enjoyed for years. One famous case was that of Mr. Breads. March 1743. In the town of Rye, East Sussex, John Breads was hiding in the local cemetery as he had planned to kill the mayor Mr. Lamb, whom he had a dispute with. But with a flick of fate, the ex-mayor Alan Grebe Bell had borrowed Mr. Lamb's cloak. Mr. Breads pounced when he saw his victim and a frenzied knife attack ensued against the wrong man. Needless to say Mr. Breads was caught and put to death. However, to make an example of him, he was hung until dead. Then his body was placed in an iron cage and left to rot for more than 20 years at Gibbet's Marsh. Get this, the cage, with Breads skull clamped within the head frame, is still kept in the town hall. If you had committed piracy or desertion, there were special iron cages for you that allowed you to still be near the sea. Well, not in the way you would have liked. The criminal would be hung inside the gibbet right near a low tide line along the river or near the sea. They would then endure approximately three high tides, where of course they would drown. This would mean every low tide would expose the corpse and create a gruesome sight for all visitors. An example of this was in London. There was actually a place called Execution Dock which was active for about 400 years. This was located on the north bank of the River Thames in Wapping. Once the criminals were dead, authorities would then move the cages a little farther down the river to Cuckold's Point or Black Wall Point, which would continue as a warning to all other waterborne criminals that might try and pass that way. Time to explore some more cases of gibbetine that will fascinate and disgust you at the same time. First up is a pirate. Captain Kidd was a pirate for a relatively short period of time as he was actually a seafarer who worked as a privateer. 
or a legally sanctioned pirate, for the British crown. He was good at his job, however, later it was declared that he had turned to piracy. Due to the political climate he became known for attacking French and British ships in the Atlantic Ocean. During this time, they claimed he made several voyages as a pirate and gained a reputation as a ruthless and successful pirate. The British government had put a bounty on his head and dispatched a naval force to capture him. Kidd eventually sailed to the Caribbean, where he was betrayed by one of his own crew members and arrested by the British authorities. He was taken to England, where he was tried and convicted of piracy. Despite his protests of innocence, Kidd was sentenced to death and executed. His final words were, I have nothing to say except that I have been sworn against by perjured and wicked people. After his execution, Captain Kidd's body was hung in an iron gibbet near the banks of the Thames River in Tilbury, England. His gibbet was intended to serve as a warning to other pirates and seafarers and to demonstrate the British government's determination to suppress piracy. Kidd's body remained in the gibbet for several years before it finally rotted away. Next is females, they were not common at all. But there was one. Marie Joseph Corriveau, also known as La Corriveau, was a Canadian woman who was convicted of murder in the 18th century. She was accused of killing her husband with a blunt object and was eventually captured and put on trial. Her father and servant were also involved, but after a second trial, she admitted to the killing. On the 18th of April 1763 in Quebec City, she was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. In an unusual move, her body was also hung in chains as a warning to others. Despite the brutality of her punishment, her story has become a part of Quebec folklore, and her name is still remembered in Canada as a symbol of crime and punishment. Moving on to the Mad Max Australian gibbets, one recorded example was of an Irish immigrant by the name Morgan Francis found himself in a bit of trouble as a new resident in Sydney, Australia. In November 1796, on the north shores of Sydney Harbour he killed a man. He of course was caught and hanged for his crimes on the Australian rocky outcrop, named Fort Denison or Pinchot, as the settlers used to call it. His body hung in chains for years as a deterrent to other immigrants. These hanging events all had certain effects on the public. Many called it barbaric and found this extreme form of punishment to be disgusting. It is pretty easy to imagine the sight of one, but one thing you can't really know is what the smell is like. Rotting and decaying flesh is one horrific smell, and if you work in the medical or police field, then you will know. But it is one smell that does not come out of your nose easily. That being said, having a body hung up on your main highway for weeks must have been horrific along with all the other medieval smells. Sometimes the hanging in chains of a criminal had the opposite effect. If a king or monarch was unpopular and they had some certain outlaws hung in this way, it was not unusual for the townspeople to take the body parts out of respect and make relics out of them. This actually happened to King Edward II in the 1300s when he killed some rebels. Finally, when did this practice stop? As popular opinion found this practice to barbaric, times were changing and this type of sentence was being phased out. The last known gibbet in England was used by a James Cook. Don't get him confused with the great explorer who sailed the oceans. James was a bookbinder who was convicted of murder. James tried to rob a creditor but ended up beating them to death, took the body home, cut it up, as you do, and then tried to burn it. James was executed on Friday the 10th of August 1832, in front of Leicester Prison. Afterwards it was said, the head was shaved and tod, to preserve it from the action of the weather and the cap in which he had suffered was drawn over his face. On Saturday afternoon his body, attired as at the time of his execution, having been firmly fixed in the irons necessary to keep the limbs together, was carried to the place of its intended suspension. After his death, the body was then put on a purpose-built gallows 33 feet high in Saffron Lane. There were thousands of people that came to view the body, but the residents of the area were appalled and considerably angry that this display of brutality was right on their doorstep. From the late 1700s this practice was already beginning to decline, and by the 1830s it was nearly over. Other countries around the world may have used it after then, but no real records indicate this.